ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय वी आर स्टडिंग द श्रीमद भगवद गीता एज इट इज chapter 18 the perfection of renunciation renunciation is one of the six opulences of the supreme personality of godhead the living entity can acquire these opulences to a minute degree but the godhead has these opulences to an unlimited degree therefore god is known as vibhu we are known as anu we are atomic but we can exhibit the opulences to a minute degree so here the chapter the perfection of renunciation renunciation is two things simultaneously one is to be detached from material sense gratification i was reading this week prabhupad was saying in the prayers of queen kunti purports that the living being actually cannot be a renouncer because the living being doesn't have anything to renounce but the living entity can renounce the propensity for material sense gratification and the other side of renunciation is attachment to krishna those who are not devotees if they try to be renounced ultimately they will fail because they don't have attachment to krishna that's why in the teachings of lord chaitanya the term yukta vairagya is used feasible renunciation renunciation that is not in connection with krishna is called suksha vairagya dry as we see the impersonalist and the mayavadis or sometimes the yogis if they're not devotee yogis they will perform severe penances in austerities very severe but they don't have that other th- side attachment to krishna so of the two attachment to krishna is more important in yukta vairagya we do not just reject everything material as the impersonalist have to do the a true impersonalist mayavadi has to reject everything material because for such a person material objects are a hindrance to spiritual progress but a devotee doesn't have to reject material things provided those material things can be used to serve krishna the impersonalist has no concept of utilizing things for krishna because he's an impersonalist but a devotee first of all sees nothing is mine which is why prabhupad said the living being cannot be a renouncer because nothing belongs to the living being anyway is this like i can't say i renounce a million dollars you don't have a million dollars what is the meaning of your renouncing no but the living being 
can utilize whatever Krishna has given to serve him. Everyone who takes birth is given a certain quota of material things, which is based on what? Yes, your previous pious activities, which is why we see some people very, very rich or very, very beautiful or very famous or any, any of the opulences in the material realm is only because that living entity in previous lives did some kind of pious activities and according to Lord Chaitanya, pious activities mixed with bhakti. Because bhakti is the real crucial determining factor. This is something that Lord Chaitanya points out. The success of even a materialistic fruitive activity it has to be tinged with some kind, some slight trace of devotional service. Otherwise, you don't get the benediction. So everybody has more or less of the material opulences based on their, what you said, past karma or fruit of activities mixed with devotional service. But now, once you come to Krishna consciousness, and you understand, oh, I want to go to the spiritual world. I want to become, as the chapter, renounced. You don't just throw everything away. You don't reject anything because you know anything that is sarvam. What did Krishna say in the seventh chapter? Yes, sarvam iti. Everything is whose property? Yes. So the devotee's attitude is, let me use everything to serve Krishna. If I have wealth, let me use it to serve Krishna. If I have musical talent, let me use it for Krishna. If I have beauty, even your beauty can be used. Lord Chaitanya was very beautiful, but he used that beauty to attract people to his message. One time, a few years ago, I was giving a lecture in North Carolina, and one knew she was a yogi, not a devotee. She was trying to become a devotee, but she was one of these, you know, these new, new age yogis, okay? So she objected. Beauty? No, you. Beauty is Maya. Now saying no. You use your beauty to serve Krishna. And she insisted, no, it's Maya. So what, she's going to make herself ugly? Or she's going to wear burqa? No. Your beauty, you use it for Krishna. It's something that has been given to you by Krishna. To deny it, that is a sin. Whatever talent Krishna has given you, don't deny it, use it. If you're intelligent, use your intelligence to serve Krishna. Me, what is my talent? My mouth. I have a big mouth. Like I've told you, the astrologer said, all my planets are in my mouth. He told my wife, your husband is one big mouth. So, I have a big mouth, but let me use it for Krishna. Let me sing for Krishna. Let me talk about Krishna. Then, I'm fine. If you have the talent for cooking, cook for Krishna. If you're an artist or a dancer, this is called Yukta Vairagya. Whatever Krishna has given you, use it for him. Otherwise, it will be your downfall. So therefore, renunciation means detachment from sense gratification and attachment to serving Krishna. 
Everybody chant the Maha Mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this 1855 is the third time in Bhagavad Gita where something is being stated. This verse is one of the most important verses throughout the Gita because it answers one million questions about spiritual life. Please repeat. Bhaktiya maam abhijanati Yavanyashchasmi tatvataha Tato maam tatvato gyatva Vishate tad anantaram Synonyms Bhaktiya By pure devotional service so Prabhupada is emphasizing pure devotional service because there's another kind of devotional service called mixed. Mixed devotional service means there's still some material aspiration on the part of the devotee. But pure devotional service does not have any tinge of materialism, either gross or subtle. Subtle uh, material desire would be the desire to merge with the Supreme. And gross material desire means sense gratification. But pure devotional service, nothing is added. It is only love of God. Next word, mom, mom. me. And of course, the speaker of Bhagavad Gita is Krishna. Abhijanati. One can know. So, the question that many people ask, is there God? Can you show me God? Here Krishna is saying, yes, you can know me. It is possible. Next word, Yavan. As much as, as, much as. Ya -cha -as, -me. Ya -cha -as me as I am, am. tatvata Tat in, in truth. So notice what these words. Not only can you know who is God, but you can know him as he is in truth. This means scientific. This means factual. Next. Tataha. Thereafter, mom, me. So, three times in the first, mom, then us, me, I, and again, mom, me. These words can only apply to a person. A non person cannot use these words, me, I, me. This only can be a person. Therefore, God is a person. Next word, tatvataha, in truth. So twice in this verse, tatvata, in truth. Gyatva, knowing. Vishate, he enters. Tat anantaram, thereafter. Please repeat. One can understand me as I am. As the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Only by devotional service. And when one is in full consciousness. Of me. By such devotion. 
He can enter into the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is known as Vaikuntha, the realm where there's no anxiety. You will agree with me. Planet Earth is not Vaikuntha. The newspapers, the television, the headlines, every day is telling you this is not a place where there's no anxiety. And in Kali Yuga, the anxiety increases day after day. There's no relief in the material realm. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. So the devotee's attitude is, I want to go to that place where there is no anxiety then as Prabhupada says, let me go back home, back to Godhead or Vaikuntha, that place where there is no anxiety. Otherwise, you come back here again and again, there's going to be anxiety. Let's look at Prabhupada's purport. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, and his plenary portions cannot be understood by mental speculation nor by the non-devotees. If anyone wants to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he has to take to pure devotional service under the guidance of a pure devotee. Otherwise, the truth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead will always be hidden. As already stated in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, verse 25, Nahang Prakasha Sarvasya. He is not revealed to everyone, nor one can understand God simply by erudite scholarship or mental speculation. Only one who is actually engaged in Krishna consciousness and devotional service can understand what Krishna is. University degrees are not helpful. One who is fully conversant with Krishna science becomes eligible to enter into the spiritual kingdom, the abode of Krishna. Becoming Brahman does not mean that one loses his identity. Devotional service is there and as long as devotional service exists, there must be God, the devotee, and the process of devotional service. I will give you an example of this. Last couple of days, I was reading in Krishna book, the story of the Brahmins and their wives. The cowherd boys woke up one day and they said to Krishna, we're very hungry. We have not had breakfast. So Krishna told the cowherd boys, over there, some brahmanas are doing a sacrifice. They are trying to go to the heavenly planets. They're not my devotees. But because they're doing a sacrifice, perhaps they will give you some food. So the cowherd boys, they're obedient. They went to the Brahmins. And they explained, we have been, and they mentioned, we have been sent by Krishna and Balaram. And we know, because the, the cowherd boys were educated, they knew, O oh, Brahmins, we know that it is not improper for you at this stage of the sacrifice to give us food. You can still do it. But the Brahmins paid no attention. Even when they heard the name Krishna and Balaram, they still, they just ignored the boys and were going about doing their yagya. So the cowherd boys went back. Krishna, they didn't even respond to us. Krishna said, you have learned a very valuable lesson. That when you go begging, you're not always going to be successful. So then Krishna said, now over here, 
the wives of those very Brahmins, they're my pure devotees. You go there. So the cowherd boys went, and as soon as they said the names Krishna and Balaram, those wives of those Brahmins gathered all kinds of food. They didn't give it to the cowherd boys. They wanted to personally bring it to Krishna and Balaram because they're pure devotees. And as soon as they heard Krishna and Balaram, like a magnet, they immediately. So they said to Krishna and Balaram, we know. You are Narayan. And Narayan is known as anyone who surrenders, he gives shelter. So we have come here. We don't want to go back to our husbands and brothers and sons. We're done with them. We want to take shelter of you. And we know you're supposed to give us shelter. Krishna told the the wives that affection for me does not depend on being in my personal presence. Proximity doesn't mean anything. Now, when the wives arrived, they it was not proper for them to go and embrace Krishna. But in their hearts, they were embracing Krishna. And their love for Krishna was so great, and Krishna was reciprocating in their hearts. So they felt oneness with Krishna because of that love. But, and Prabhupada makes the point in that, the Brahmins' wives did not lose their identity neither did Krishna but they felt oneness because of that love oneness means there's nothing in between oneness means whatever Krishna wants I want and that reminds us of what Krishna told Durvasa Muni when Durvasa Muni was being chased by the Sudarshan Chakra. Who did he offend? Ambarish. So, at that time, Narayan told Durvasa, very important statement. In my devotees' hearts, they only know me. And therefore, in my heart, I only know them. That's oneness. That's love. So in the same way, these wives of the Brahmins, even though they were a separate from Krishna, they didn't physically embrace him. But in their hearts, they felt that oneness. And Krishna reciprocated in their heart. So then Krishna told the wives, your husbands, they need you. So you should go back. And they, the wives said, but who will take us back now that we have left? Vedic culture was so strict. They said, they won't take us back because we left home. Krishna said, no, no, no. You're my pure devotees. Nobody will find fault with you. So you go back because your husbands need you. So the wives were obedient to Krishna. Surrender means obedience. Prabhupada said, the, before you can have love of God, there has to be obedience to God. So these wives of the Brahmins, they were obedient. They wanted to stay. They, they were ready to just right there. But Krishna said, no, you go back. And when they went back to their husbands, by this time, they finally woke up. And the Brahmins said to themselves, our wives are more advanced than we. We could not recognize Krishna and Balaram as God 
But our wives, they immediately surrendered. And the Brahmins condemned themselves. We, we're in Maya. And they were cursing themselves. Our wives, they're not sophisticated, they're not educated like us, and yet they could surrender to Krishna and we could not. Then the Brahmins decided we should surrender to Krishna, but then they thought, oh, wait, wait, wait. We got to worry about Kamsa, that there might be some retaliation. So still, they could not surrender because they were too attached to the material plane. But the wives of those Brahmins, they wanted to completely surrender. They kept their identity, Krishna kept his identity. So that's why it says here, liberation involves getting free from the concept of material life. In spiritual life, the same distinction is there. The same individuality is there, but in pure Krishna consciousness. So, when you go back home, back to Godhead, you won't be in this body, but you will still be a unique, separate, individual person. You will always be an individual, like you've heard me say many times, like a joke. Get used to yourself because you're always going to be an individual person. Let's continue with the purport. One should not mistakenly think that the word vishate enters into me supports the monistic theory that one becomes homogeneous with the impersonal Brahman. No. Vishate means that one can enter into the abode of the Supreme Lord in one's individuality to engage in his association and render service unto him. That is what we are aspiring for. Even Lord Kapila talked about this that I offer my devotee five kinds of liberation, but not if it means no service. The devotee wants service. This is a very important teaching of Lord Chaitanya. The de and you should know that Shikshastakam prayer, number four, that birth after birth, even doesn't matter if I get liberated. Bhagavad bhakti ahoituki twai. The devotee's attitude is even I have to take birth again, that's okay. But, uh -uh, there's a but. I need pure service unto your lotus feet. That's what the devotee wants. When we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. What are we asking for? Are we asking for wealth when we chant? Are we asking for a beautiful body? Are we asking for popularity? What are we asking for when we chant? More service. Exactly. That's what we're... So, don't... don't, don't how should I say? Don't be surprised that by chanting, you get a phone call and somebody says, I need you to do devotional service. Yes, you have been chanting, then Krishna reciprocates in so many ways. Let us continue. Vishate means that one can enter into the abode of the Supreme Lord in one's individuality to engage in his association and render service unto him. For instance, a green bird enters a green tree, not to become one with the tree, but to enjoy the fruits of the tree. Impersonalists generally give the example of a river flowing into the ocean and merging. This may be a source of happiness for the impersonalist, but the personalist keeps his personal individuality like an aquatic in the ocean. We find so many living entities within the ocean if we go deep. Surface acquaintance with the ocean 
is not sufficient. One must have complete knowledge of the aquatics living in the ocean depths. Because of his pure devotional service, a devotee can understand the transcendental qualities and opulences of the Supreme Lord in truth. As it is stated in the 11th chapter, only by devotional service can one understand. The same is confirmed here. One can understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead by devotional service and enter into His Kingdom. After attainment of the Brahma Bhuta stage of freedom from material conception, devotional service begins by one's hearing about the Lord. So that's the first process, hearing. When one hears about the Supreme Lord, automatically the Brahma Bhuta stage develops and material contamination, greediness, and lust for sense enjoyment disappears. As lust and desires disappear from the heart of a devotee, he becomes more attached to the service of the Lord. And by such attachment, he becomes free from material contamination. In that state of life, he can understand the Supreme Lord. This is the statement of Srimad Bhagavatam also. After liberation, the process of bhakti or transcendental service continues. Because the reason why Prabhupada is making that point, sometimes the impersonalist will do devotional service until they achieve liberation. And when they achieve liberation, the service stops. But devotee, that's not what a devotee does. The devotee doesn't want to stop service. It's not a job. No. And as Prabhupada and I've said many times, what we're doing now is apprenticeship. We are not really done the real thing. We are practicing. Where is Govind? Practice. We are practicing for the real Super Bowl in the spiritual kingdom. That is where the real, this, this is the practicing stage. We're getting ready. Not we are apprentices. Once we go back to Godhead, then that's when it begins. The real devotional service begins. So let's continue. The Vedanta Sutra confirms this. A prayanat tatra pihi drishnam. This means that after liberation, the process of devotional service continues. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, real devotional liberation is defined as the reinstatement of the living entity in his own identity, his own constitutional position. Prabhupada there is referring to a verse in the second canto. And that is very important. Reinstatement. Reinstatement means it was there previously, it was lost, now you're being reinstated. Therefore, where were we originally from? Yes, the spiritual world. Otherwise, he can't use that word, reinstatement. Sometimes you lose your driver's license. Then it gets reinstated. You already had it. You lost it. Now you're getting reinstated. So in the liberated state, in the original state, we were with Krishna. We fell down. Now we are being reinstated. Back to Godhead. Same thing. We were there originally. The constitutional position is already explained. Every living entity is a part and parcel, fragmental portion of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, his constitutional position is to serve. That's why I sing that song. You got to serve somebody. 
It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you have to serve somebody. After liberation, this service is never stopped. Actual liberation is getting free from misconceptions of life. Everybody chant the Maha Mantra. Yeah. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Chapter 18, the verse number 56. Sarva karmanya pisada. Sarva karmanya pisada. Kurvano madhya pasrayaha. Kurvano madhya pasrayaha. Mat prasada davapnoti. Mat prasada davapnoti. Shasvatang padam avyayam. Shasvatang padam avyayam. Sarva. All, All. Karmani, Karmani activities, activities. Api, Api, although, although. Sada, Sada, always, always. Kurvana, Kurvana, performing, performing. Matvya under my protection, Matprasadat, by my mercy, mercy. Avapnoti, one achieves, One achieves. Shashvatam, Shashvatam, the eternal, the eternal. Padam, Padam, abode, abode. Avyayam, avyayam, imperishable. imperishable. Though, engaged in all kinds of activities, Though engaged in all kinds of activities, my pure devotee, my pure devotee under, my under my protection, reaches the eternal, an imperishable abode by my grace. So here is what we have to look forward to. First point, in this Krishna consciousness, there are all different kinds of activities. There are the nine activities, hearing, chanting, remembering, worshiping, praying, serving, surrendering but under all of those there are so many specific activities so the beauty of krishna consciousness is that you have so much activities at your disposal and the idea is to keep yourself always active serving krishna that's the secret of success. Either you're chanting, or you're hearing, or you're worshipping, or you're studying, or you're cooking. You're keeping yourself active in Krishna's service. That's the key to success. In the description of Maharaj Ambarish, there's that verse. That even though he was the king, he was bowing down for the deity. He was offering nice flowers to the deity. He was uh, touching the deity. And he was conversing with the devotees. All of the different limbs of his body. He was using his eyes to look at the deity. So we want to engage all of our senses as much as possible throughout the day in activities serving Krishna. Then Krishna says, under my protection. So that's what Krishna does. He gives protection to his devotees. We sing a prayer for protection. What prayer do we sing? Yes. We want protection from Lord Nisringa, whenever there's any scare, any fear, immediately we take shelter of Krishna, immediately. Then the next point, where are we going to go? 
that abode which is eternal and imperishable. But by whose grace? Yes. As Prabhupada mentioned, you can do all kinds of devotional service. But the devotee cannot expect or demand, okay, Krishna? No. That's why it's called causeless mercy. Causeless mercy. Krishna doesn't have to. He does, but he doesn't have to. So the devotee's attitude is, when Krishna will deliver me, only then. Until then, I'm going to keep doing my devotional service. Not that, man, I've been, I've been doing this for 50 years. What, when's he going to? No, that's not the devotee's attitude. The devotee's attitude, the devotee's attitude is like Rukmini. When Rukmini wrote her letter, she didn't threaten Krishna. Krishna, either you marry me or else. No, what was Rukmini's attitude? Krishna, if you feel that I'm not fit, then I am prepared to take 100 births so that I can be your wife. You see the attitude? Not that, Krishna, either you come or I commit suicide. No. Rukmini's attitude was, however long it takes, that's the attitude of the devotee. Not that, right now, come on, let's go. The devotee's attitude is always meek and humble. Let's go to Prabhupada's purport. Even in Chaitanya Charitramritam too, right? What's that? Yes, tell the story. Go into the mic and tell the story. I don't know the whole story. But yes. So there was one disciple of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Chaitanya told his other disciples, I don't want to see that Mukunda. The devotee said, why? Because he's hanging out with the Mayavadis. And I don't want to see his face. Tell him not to come anymore. So the devotees went to Mukunda and said, Lord Chaitanya doesn't want to see it. Mukunda said, means he'll never deliver me. So they went back to Lord Chaitanya. And he said, will you, will you ever accept Mukunda again? Lord Chaitanya said, maybe in a million births. So they went back to Mukunda and said, Lord Chaitanya said, in a million births. What was Mukunda's? Was Only a million births? That's all? You see the attitude? And when Lord Chaitanya heard that, he said, okay, call him back. Because he had the right attitude. I mentioned this the other Sunday when I was in Los Angeles. Prabhupada writes, everything is dependent on the attitude of the devotee. If the devotee has the right attitude, everything is going to happen for you. So that's our main thing. And what is that attitude? Trinadapi sunechena sarariva sahishnuna amanina manadena Kirtaniyas. That's the attitude of a devotee. And that's why we're told that mantra should be around our neck for constant remembrance. Even though I'm sitting here, I have to remember that verse. No matter where I am and what situation, always, always remain meek and humble. Everyone chant the Maha Mantra. Let's look at Prabhupada's purport. The word mud the apashraya means under the protection of the Supreme Lord. To be free from material contamination, a pure devotee acts under the direction of the Supreme Lord or his representative, the spiritual master. There is no time limitation for a pure devotee. He is always 24 hours a day 100% engaged in activities under the direction of the Supreme Lord. To a devotee who is thus engaged in Krishna consciousness, 
the Lord is very, very kind. In spite of all difficulties, he is eventually placed in the transcendental abode or Krishna Loka. He is guaranteed entrance there. There is no doubt about it. In that supreme abode, there is no change. Everything is eternal, imperishable, and full of knowledge. This reminds me of one of Lord Brahma's prayers. Lord Brahma's prayer, one of his prayers was that the devotee still understands there's going to be some reactions to my previous karma. But that reaction is what? Shrunk down. You only get a love tap. But still, once you surrender to Krishna, you're still going to get some residual of your past karma. But instead of your neck being chopped off, you cut yourself when you're shaving. There's going to be something, some little it's your karma is shrunk, 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 shrunk down. But still there's going to be something. So the devotee's attitude is, as long as I'm in this material world, as long as I have a material body, there's going to be some pinching, there's going to be some suffering. The devotee tolerates it and continues to offer prayers to Krishna despite the different upheavals. But the devotee knows, don't worry, it, in time, I'm going to go back to Godhead. Why? The word used by Lord Brahma, Dayabak. It's your inheritance. Once you surrender to Krishna, you become inherited to the kingdom of God. You just have to be patient. How patient? Again, it's up to Krishna. So the devotee tolerates the different upheavals, the different sufferings, and goes on praying and surrendering to Krishna, knowing, don't worry, the day is coming, when I will go back home, back to God. And everybody chant. Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. All right, can you do it one more time? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Let's do the next verse, shall we? Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Chaitasa Sarva Karmani Mai sanyasya matpara Mai sanyasya matpara Buddhi yogam upasritya Buddhi yogam upasritya Machchitta satatam bhava Machchitta satatam bhava Chetasa Chetasa By intelligence By intelligence That reminds me In the second chapter Krishna introduced something called Buddhi yoga Linking with God by means of intelligence. Next word. Sarva karmani. Sarva karmani. All kinds of activities. All kinds of activities. Mai. Unto me. Unto me. Sanyasya, Sanyasya. Giving up. Giving up. Matpara, Matpara. Under my protection. Under my protection. Bodhi yogam. Devotional activities. So there it is. Bodhi yoga. Upasritya, Upasritya, taking shelter of, of. Machchitta, in, in consciousness of me, Satatam, Satatam 24, hours a day. 24 hours a day, Bhava, Bhava. 
just speak up. So, um, okay, let's just go. Translation, please repeat. In all activities, In all activities just, depend upon me just depend upon me and work always under my protection. In such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. So look, me, my, me. Krishna is person. Very important, very important concept. Accepting Krishna, God, as a person. Let's look at the purport. When one acts in Krishna consciousness, he does not act as the master of the world. Just like a servant, one should act fully under the direction of the Supreme Lord. A servant has no individual independence. He acts only on the order of the Master. A servant acting on behalf of the Supreme Master is unaffected by profit and loss. He simply discharges his duty faithfully in terms of the order of the Lord. Now, one may argue that Arjuna was acting under the personal direction of Krishna. But when Krishna is not present, how should one act? If one acts according to the direction of Krishna in this book, what's this book? as well as under the guidance of the representative of Krishna, then the result will be the same. So this is, you could say, one essential building block of Krishna consciousness. We're working according to the Bhagavad Gita and under the guidance of Krishna's representative, the devotee or the spiritual master. The Sanskrit word matpara is very important in this verse. It indicates that one has no goal in life save and accept acting in Krishna consciousness just to satisfy Krishna. Now this next sentence is very, very important. So, please let this next sentence go deep inside you. And while working in that way, one should think of Krishna only. Quote, I have been appointed to discharge this particular duty by Krishna. So you've heard me say all these years that you can begin Krishna consciousness just by, I used to say this all the time, Especially to somebody who says, I can't chant, I can't do this. So that I would tell that person, okay, when you get in your car and you are going to work, when you turn on the key, you say, Krishna, I offer this day to you. Just that very act is the beginning. You're at least acknowledging, Krishna, I am your servant. So here, I have been appointed to discharge this particular duty by Krishna. So when you're going to your classes in college, think like that. When you're taking care of your family, think like that. When you're going to your job in the federal building, same thing. You're not really working for Obama. You have been given this particular duty by... Yeah, we're not going to be Obama conscious. What to speak of, Trump conscious. <laughs> but we are going to be Krishna conscious. We're going to do our duties. I've been given this by Krishna. While acting in such a way one naturally has to think of Krishna. This is perfect Krishna consciousness. See how it's really simple. The trick is to do it. 
So whether I'm cooking or eating or even sleeping, you can sleep for Krishna. I'm going to take rest now because this is my duty for Krishna. Every, it's a matter of simply accepting and then executing. Everything being done for Krishna. One should, however, note that after doing something whimsically, he should not offer the result to the Supreme Lord. In other words, I'm going to go out and do some sinful activity. Oh, I, I, I offered that to Krishna. No, 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 no. No, there are people who think like that. I'm going to commit this crime and then I'm going to offer it to... No. No. Don't be silly. This sort of duty is not in devotional service of Krishna consciousness. One should act to the order of Krishna. This is a very important point. So even Prabhupada is emphasizing. This is a very important point. The order of Krishna comes through disciplic succession from the bona fide spiritual master. Therefore, the spiritual master's order should be taken as the prime duty of life. Anybody remember? I've told the story many times. What do I take as Prabhupada's order to me? Does anybody remember what I've said? Yes. Yes. That my order from Prabhupada, love Krishna. That's what I take. Because I asked him that question. He said, love Krishna. If one gets a bona fide spiritual master and acts according to his direction, then one's perfection of life in Krishna consciousness is guaranteed. Everybody chant the Maha Mantra. Okay, now, 